On November 16, 2019, the people of Louisiana re-elected Governor Edwards to another four-year term. On January 13, 2020, Governor Edwards was sworn into his second term as the 56th governor of Louisiana. Governor Edwards continued to do what the people sent him to Baton Rouge to do, put Louisiana first. Hundreds of thousands are insured. Louisiana's budget is stable and Louisiana is open for business. And I know Governor Edwards, I want to thank you personally for the great job during this very tough year that you've had to leave. Thank you again for making the time in your busy schedule to be with us once again. It's our pleasure to have you and, and to listen to your words. Thank you very much, Governor Edwards. Myra, thank you so much. I appreciate you for all the work you do, and, and I thank you for that very gracious uh, introduction, and uh, thank Martha for her, her work as well. Um, this is a little different um, uh, format than I'm used to seeing, so I just want a thumbs up from you, Myra, if you could hear me right now. Okay, good deal. Uh, I, I appreciate everybody on this call for the work that you do uh, in communities all across Louisiana every single day. It, it is incredibly uh, important. And, and the virtual meeting right now, unfortunately, is, is the best that we can do um, and remain safe. I recall very vividly speaking to you all a year ago here in Baton Rouge at the Hilton, as I've done a number of times. Uh, but boy, the year uh, that we've had since then has been tough. In fact, it seems like about 10 years uh, worth of work crammed into one. And I know that's true for all of you all uh, as well. Um, we are just in a very different place than we were a year ago. Um, you know, it, it's been a challenge. Uh, Myra told you about the circumstances uh, in the state of Louisiana when I became governor with respect to record budget deficits, and we had really called back and we're in a great place. And at this time last year, we actually had the fourth fastest growing economy in the country uh, when COVID hit uh, and, and, and really caused uh, problems across the country and here in Louisiana. Uh, but I want you to know that I remain very optimistic about our future. Uh, I believe that we will close out this year much better than it started, and, and it'll be a much better year overall than in 2020. Um, and even, even saying that, I can tell you, and I'm going to give you some examples in just a moment, uh, we had some very significant economic development wins, and, and we've made uh, tremendous progress since the, the worst part of the pandemic with respect to its impact on the economy, at least uh, to date. Uh, but obviously, COVID-19 has changed everything. Um, after almost a year of intense efforts to overcome the disease uh, as a state, uh, we're right at 400,000 cases. And, and by the way, these are confirmed cases with tests. Uh, we know that up to 50% of all people who get COVID-19 are not symptomatic and they don't necessarily take a test. Um, but there have been at least 400,000 discrete individuals test positive um, and, and so we know more than that have, have actually had the disease. Uh, we now have over 8,500 deaths. Um, and I will tell you that currently there are more than 1,600 uh, patients in our hospitals across Louisiana because of COVID-19. And, and that's uh, severely testing our uh, healthcare delivery system and challenging our ability to preserve the capacity that we need to provide life-saving care to people, not just because of COVID. You could be a car accident or a stroke or a heart attack, or you name it. If, if you need a hospital bed and, and staff uh, to give you life-saving care, you've got to have that capacity there. And, and uh, we're doing a little better than we were just a few weeks ago because we got to almost 2,100 because of the Thanksgiving and Christmas and, and New Year surge. It appears that we're flattening off now, but at a very, very high level. And we all need to be particularly concerned about that, especially as we discuss new variants uh, of the virus, uh, one from the UK, others from Brazil and South Africa, which seem to be more easily transmitted uh, and uh, also potentially more dangerous, uh, although that, that's not yet uh, as fully established. But it is more important than ever to protect ourselves and to protect our family, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers and employees. If we want to be able to make it through this in the best possible shape and remain uh, viable in terms of our businesses, 
uh, we, we have to make sure that, that we are doing everything uh, reasonably, uh, reasonable, I should say, to protect one another. Uh, and, and I think it was uh, Martha who said it a while ago, and I'm gonna talk about the vaccine in just a moment. Uh, and the vaccine is very promising. Uh, it is the way that we're gonna end up putting this pandemic behind us is by getting enough people vaccinated. Um, but that's gonna take quite a while. It is true today that the single most important tool we have to protect our family, our friends, our coworkers, uh, neighbors, known and unknown, is this mask. This, this is the single most important thing that we can do because the vaccine is not available for everybody today. We don't have the quantities necessary to get everybody vaccinated right away. Uh, and we're having to work through our priority groups. But this mask is available for everyone. Uh, and it does confer a benefit on the wearer as well because the wearer of the mask is less likely to contract the disease also. You're gonna be hearing from Dr. Joe Kanner a little bit later this morning. He and his team at the Department of Health and the Office of Public Health are doing just tremendous work uh, and have been for many, many months now. Um, and they literally work around the clock seven days a week uh, as we continue to respond to the pandemic. Uh, and he's gonna give you all lots of really good information. But I did wanna discuss uh, some of the ways that we're working to address health equity. You know, one of the biggest things we can do right now, uh, besides wearing our mask and socially distancing, uh, staying home when we're sick, washing our hands, is to get the vaccine when it's your turn, meaning when you're in the priority group. Uh, and I also need your help uh, to make sure that people that you have influence with, and you have influence probably that you're unaware of, all over the state of Louisiana, um, and not just to the Hispanic community, but, but you have influence, period, this vaccine is safe and effective. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a Pfizer vaccine, it's a, a Moderna vaccine. I anticipate that Johnson & Johnson uh, may come online next. Uh, and if it's granted an emergency use authorization, that will mean it's safe and effective as well. But we need your help promoting this uh, because we know there's still vaccine hesitancy out there in certain groups. Um, and it's less pronounced in the Hispanic community than it is in uh, the African-American community, but we know that there's still an awful lot of vaccine hesitancy uh, in the Hispanic community as well. But back in April, I created the Health Equity Task Force to work with the Department of Health, uh, the Office of Public Health, um, and, and critically important because we knew that the, the disease was having a disparate impact on minority communities. Uh, and, and what it did is it, it shined a bright light on, on the health outcomes in our state, which have been uneven for a very, very long time. Um, and, and because of the prevalence of comorbid health conditions uh, in certain parts of our state, um, driven by socioeconomic factors, uh, which are particularly prevalent uh, among African-American communities and also uh, the Hispanic community, uh, we know that COVID-19 was causing deaths, uh, for example, uh, way beyond what would be expected. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, Myra mentioned the uh, Medicaid expansion. I am 100% convinced that had we not expanded Medicaid in 2016 and made primary care, preventative care, and prescription drugs available to about 400,000 more uh, working poor in Louisiana, that the impact of COVID-19 would e be even worse because we were able to get people healthier before the pandemic set in. But I am, I am not uh, in, in any way uh, trying to tell you that because of Medicaid expansion, uh, we didn't have problems. We, we did, just like the rest of the country. Uh, but, but now I want to make sure that we, we promote uh, the safety and efficacy of the vaccine in an equitable way too. Uh, and as we make sure that we are distributing and administering the vaccine uh, in communities that are disadvantaged and hard to reach, uh, much like we had to do through testing, uh, where, where we had to actually send strike teams into certain zip codes in order to make sure there was enough testing available, uh, we're going to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to distribute and administer vaccine in a way that is equitable as well. Um, we know that when we have we know that we have to build trust uh, in, in the vaccine uh, in communities of color. Uh, 
because there's there's a lot of distrust on vaccines in general, and this seems particularly true with respect to um, these vaccines for, for COVID-19. We also know from an earlier national survey, uh, the Latinx communities uh, have a higher willingness than African-American communities to take the vaccine. Uh, but as I mentioned, there's still issues that we have to overcome in, in, in both of these communities. Um, the task force is supporting the Department of Health, the Office of Public Health, in its community engagement and communications campaign. We're standing up four vaccine advisory councils to take the lead in community engagement. The advisory councils are established by sector. One of those sectors is healthcare. Another is the faith-based community. Uh, then we have the public sector and we have the community sector. And I understand that the Office of Public Health has reached out to your organization to participate in the community sector advisory council. Um, and I want to encourage you to participate um, you are a critical part of what we're trying to do if we're going to be successful. So, so please uh, participate, help as you can. In the spring, the task force is going to be reaching out as they continue to work with the Department of Health to unveil a new health assessment dashboard and begin the community engagement process uh, in an effort to ensure that my weekly COVID press conferences reach more people. Uh, we've been recording a Spanish language interpretation that can be accessed through my YouTube page. Uh, which is under the username Louisiana Gov, Louisiana Gov. At the same time, we've been battling the public health aspects of COVID-19. We've obviously been working overtime to learn how to conduct business in these unusual circumstances. You know, how do you keep your doors open? How do you keep your customers safe? How, because if they don't feel safe, they're not coming in. Uh, how do you keep your your workers uh, safe and 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 maintain uh, an efficient business? when maybe you're having to do a lot more work from, from home and, and, and those sorts of things. How do you balance a budget uh, with the changing business conditions that we're seeing? We're doing the same things at state government. Um, and I know and, and it's, it's a challenging for us, and I know it has to be challenging for you, because quite frankly, I have more assets at my disposal than you do probably. Uh, our commissioner, Jay Darden, uh, can attest to what a steep challenge this has been for the state of Louisiana. Um, and so I know that your individual businesses, uh, without all the resources that we have, um, have been challenged too. And that's why we've worked at every turn to locate and deploy financial assistance that can help Louisiana's uh, small businesses. We're grateful that the Louisiana small businesses were able to uh, capture over $7 billion in Paycheck Protection Program assistance through the CARES Act last year. Uh, we're hopeful that Congress can successfully pass an additional COVID-19 stimulus package uh, that President Biden uh, has outlined with $440 billion allotted for small businesses and communities across the country. And I know the details are still being hammered out in the negotiations, uh, but hopefully that will happen. And it could come as soon as, as February, although some people think March is, is more likely. Um, and then it wasn't just the pandemic this year that have impacted us. Uh, Louisiana was struck by three separate hurricanes, uh, including the strongest hurricane to hit Louisiana since at least 1856, uh, Hurricane Laura that hit in late August down in uh, southwest Louisiana. And a couple of months later, Hurricane Delta hit in that same area. I think it was about 10 miles away on the coast where, where it made landfall. Um, more than 80% of all damage in the United States in 2020 from Atlantic hurricanes happened in Louisiana. Uh, so I'll say that again. Uh, more than 80% of all the damage in the country from hurricanes in the, in the Atlantic uh, for last year happened in Louisiana. And as a result, uh, more than $800 million in hurricane assistance has come to us from FEMA and the U.S. Small Business Administration. And obviously the bulk of that is associated with Hurricane Laura, um, which had its biggest impact in Southwest Louisiana. But for the first time in history, uh, we had a storm that was still at hurricane strength as far north as Monroe, Louisiana. That's never happened before. And we're very much in active assistance uh, mode with Hurricane Zeta that actually hit in New Orleans uh, later in the year, and, and not just New Orleans, but, but in Southeast Louisiana. Uh, and if you sustain physical property damage from Zeta, I want to remind you that the deadline to apply to the Small Business Administration for assistance from them is March the 1st. 
while the deadline for economic injury applications is October the 1st. And Michael Ricks is one of your other speakers you're going to have today. I know um, that as a Louisiana District Director for the Small Business Administration, he's going to give you a lot more uh, information on this. Uh, but please take advantage of whatever assistance out there uh, that you need. So from COVID-19 to hurricanes, uh, 2020 taught us the importance of disaster response, uh, recovery, uh, and preparation as well. Um, and that's why in April, I created the Resilient Louisiana Commission. And by May, they reported to me on recommendations for safely reopening the economy. 15 individual task forces uh, focusing on every single aspect of our economy. Um, and then in November, they completed a report of long-term recommendations called a comprehensive game plan for a more resilient Louisiana. Uh, this commission chaired by LED Secretary Don Pearson and the healthcare executive uh, Terry Sterling uh, drew from the expertise of over 300 citizen leaders to compile this new game plan. And this is why it's important. The Resilient Louisiana Commission looked at every single facet of life in our state, every sector of our economy, and they recommended key steps for making our state more resilient. Things like investing more in early childhood education, building a better and safer infrastructure of highways and bridges, expanding access to quality health care and broadband internet to everyone in Louisiana, uh, making sure our small businesses have access uh, to capital, and so many other things uh, that, that they've reported on. Uh, and I know some of you contributed to this game plan, so I thank you very much uh, for that. I encourage all of you to go to opportunitylouisiana.com slash resilient Louisiana to learn more about these priorities and these recommendations. Again, that's opportunitylouisiana.com slash resilient uh, Louisiana. And please work with our administration and the legislature to help us accomplish these priority steps. You know, we, we wanted to compile a report uh, and with key recommendations that would help us move into the future. Uh, obviously, we have to enact those recommendations. Many of them uh, require legislation. So we, we ask you to please uh, be involved in the legislative session that starts in April. It's a 60-day uh, session this year. That, that's, uh, it's called a fiscal session. Uh, and and we're, gonna, we're gonna be working hard to make sure that we are advancing those priorities through uh, the legislature. I also want to tell you a little bit about our economy, obviously very challenged. You know, uh, at the deepest part of the downturn last spring, uh, the decline in employment in Louisiana was right at 300,000 jobs. Think about that. In the state of Louisiana, 300,000 jobs were lost. Uh, by the end of the year, we had recaptured all but about 90,000 of those jobs, uh, and we continue to make headway but we have a lot of our brothers and sisters uh, who are not working, uh, or maybe they're working for a lower wage or fewer hours. And, and there are so many challenges uh, that continue to face them and our businesses, our families, uh, our state as a whole. But I will tell you, I've been impressed by the resilience of our small businesses in Louisiana throughout, throughout this year of crisis. Um, it has been a challenging year to deliver the services necessary. Uh, so, for example, we've never had as many people uh, filing for unemployment uh, assistance as we had this past year. Uh, and brand new uh, uh, programs for assistance were created by Congress uh, to include uh, uh, self-employed gig workers and so forth that never uh, was part of our, of our process before. Um, and, and while, like every state, uh, we were slower than we wanted to be in processing and administering those claims. I can tell you that recently the U.S. Department of Labor, it was one of the last things that they did under the Trump administration, recognized Louisiana as being number one in the country for the timely processing and payment of unemployment claims. We're not satisfied. We, we, we know that we, we still have to do better, um, but I think you can just imagine uh, how difficult this was to administer so many different and new programs all at the same time for so many different people who were, who were applying for this assistance. Uh, we also last year, uh, despite everything that was going on, we secured 58 major project wins uh, for the state of Louisiana. 
totaling more than $12.7 billion in new capital investment for the state. Uh, they're going to retain uh, more than 8,600 existing jobs across our state, and they're going to result in more than 11,600 new jobs in leading industries. Um, and in fact, we had the second biggest economic development deal in the nation with growing fuels uh, at the port of uh, Greater Baton Rouge. Uh, this is this is a project to create a refinery to to produce diesel uh, from renewable sources such as soybean and corn, uh, and number two uh, project in the country last year. Uh, and we still have a lot more work to do, but I want you to know that I'm optimistic about our future. I want you to be optimistic about our future. And while we have light at the end of the tunnel from the pandemic because of the uh, vaccine and the vaccinations, uh, we've got work to do between now and then to reduce transmission. Our percent positivity, meaning the percentage of tests that we're administering on a daily basis, remains, remains far too high. Uh, it exceeds 10%. Um, when the goal is no more than 5%. Um, cases, uh, new cases remain high. Every single parish, all 64 parishes, have a high incidence for new uh, cases of COVID um, per the CDC with more than 100 per 100,000 over a seven week period. That's all 64 parishes. We still have too many people in the hospital and unfortunately we have far too many people who are dying of, of COVID-19 uh, every single day. So we still have a lot of work to do. I'm going to ask for your help, your continued partnership. Uh, let's let's put our mask on, let's social distance, let's wash our hands, stay home when we're sick, and make sure you give your employers the opportunity to do these things, please. It's, it's so critically important. And then let's get the vaccine when we're able to do so. And between now and then, let's promote the safety and efficacy of the vaccine to overcome the hesitancy. Because quite simply put, the only way we put this pandemic behind us is when a big enough percentage of the people in our state and in the country, and quite frankly, in the world, uh, but we can only do our part, but a big enough percentage has to actually be vaccinated. We're gonna keep working very hard to improve our efficiency, the utilization of vaccine, uh, depending on, on the day and the source. Uh, we rank somewhere between about six in the country to 12 in the country in, in terms of vaccine utilization. Um, again, we're not satisfied with that. We're gonna keep getting better. And we got some positive news out of the White House yesterday that, that our vaccine allocation is gonna increase by 16%. And they're gonna give us three weeks uh, of stability on our allocations so that we have a longer time to plan. Uh, believe it or not, uh, up until now, we find out our final uh, allocation on a Thursday. Uh, and then we had to put in our orders uh, for a vaccine that was going to be delivered the following Monday and do all of our communication with our with our partners who are going to be receiving and administering uh, these vaccines. That's very, very difficult, especially for a state like ours, where we chose to engage multiple partners throughout the community. So we have 324 enrolled providers this week who are administering vaccines in all 64 parishes of our state with a strong emphasis on equity. Um, but having three weeks to notice is gonna give us much more time to refine our plans, communicate them, and make sure that our partners are fully prepared and that, that they're not scheduling more appointments they're gonna, than they're gonna be able to keep. So, so we're, we're doing relatively well, but nobody's gonna uh, tell you that we're satisfied. We still need more vaccine as soon as we're able to get it. Um, and, and I need your help in promoting uh, the, the vaccine in terms of its safety and efficacy. So thank you so much for your diligence of working hard, for staying safe until, until that day comes. Uh, please communicate with me or LED, anything, or Department of Health, whatever you all might need uh, for assistance because, because we're in this together uh, and we're in it to win. So God bless you. Thank you so much. Uh, I wish you nothing but the best of success uh, throughout 2021. And Myra, Thank you for your personal work and leadership at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Louisiana. Thank you, Governor Edwards, and God bless you. Uh, I know it's been a very tough year, but you've done a great job and we're very proud of it. I have my mask and we continue to work very, very hard to, to disseminate that information. Count on us as a partner to continue helping and, and 
to help with the vaccine. Um, also, everything, all the information that needs to go through the community, we're here uh, standing tall to, to be side by side with your administration and continue working uh, in every aspect. I do have a couple of questions for you from the from the um, audience, uh, if you'd like to take Okay. Them. Um, I think I can do that. Okay, so one is last year, the governor stated that procurement with minority businesses would be increased. A year later, can we see any data? What about a subcontracting program like other states and the federal government have done? And I know it, it was not a typical year, so we can only <laughs> go by what what we were able to do, but I know that's one uh, area that you uh, that you take very seriously and you've been working on. Yeah, we have, and, and in fact, uh, I apologize, I don't have the numbers, but I received a briefing, for example, from Sean Wilson, Dr. Wilson, who is the uh, Secretary of the Department of Transportation and Development, and I know uh, that just at his agency alone, uh, there was a very significant increase in the number and the dollar amount of contracts that were awarded to minority uh, businesses uh, from here in Louisiana. Uh, and, and I can assure you uh, that every time we have significant procurements coming up, uh, I am revisiting this issue with agencies all across the state uh, to make sure that, that where we possibly can, uh, we're awarding contracts or subcontracts uh, to uh, minority business enterprises and those that, are, that have been disadvantaged. Um, and, and so we, we continue to work on that. I, Amara, uh, between uh, Sean and Mandy Mitchell at LED, I can get you more specific information. Um, quite frankly, I, I didn't prepare for this particular uh, a presentation like I have in the past because of all the other things going on, especially around the, uh, the vaccine. And I was in Lake Charles yesterday uh, doing uh, hurricane recovery meetings, but but I can tell you we are doing better, um, and I'm going to get you the the, the numbers uh, how we quantify that uh, so Absolutely. that you can share that with your members. Well, Governor, I I understand. Again, we thank you for taking the time because I know those are priorities, and and you're everywhere all the time. So thank you again, and we look forward to 2022 where we can give you shake your in hand, person. And give you in person, <laughs> take pictures, and all the fun things we do when when we have our event in Baton Rouge. Thank you again. Yes, have a great day and. Again, we're we're here for you. Uh, don't hesitate to to contact us any way we can help with this process, and we will recover. We're doing it together. That is the bright as brought yes, our communities together. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mara. God bless you and everyone. Thank you.